the previous episode, I showed you how to use Mini Profiler to detect the slow portions of a Rails application and optimize them. But improving the performance of the server side is only half the battle. Much of what makes a web page feel slow can be on the client side as well in the loading and parsing of the resources. In this episode, I will show you several tools for analyzing what's going on on the client side and give you some tips on how to improve performance so your site will feel even faster. Now I'll be demonstrating this using railscast.com and our goal is to determine what's really going on when we load the page and what are some things we can do to improve that performance. Now you may notice I'm using Google Chrome here because it has some nice developer tools for analyzing this. I'm going to open those up using command option I. And the first thing I want to show you is this network tab. I'll go here and then you need to hit reload on the page to see the results. So this gives us a detailed waterfall report telling what happened. You can see the entire process took about a second to complete. And this lists out the various requests which were made and how long each one took to process. Now each bar in this timeline is made up of two parts. The lighter shade tells us when the request was made up to the point that it started receiving data back from the server. And then it continues on with a darker shade until it finishes processing the request. And you can hover over to see further details of where the request has spent the most time. So as far as Rails is concerned, it took about a couple hundred milliseconds to process this request, which I'm sure could be improved, but that's still only a fraction of the entire time this page took to load. And here I want to focus on what happens outside of that Rails request through the rest of this time. Now there's also more to the story than what we're seeing here. You can see the dark bar for each of these requests shows zero milliseconds. And if I hover over one, the receiving portion says zero. And this is because a Chrome is reading from the cache instead of using the full response that it's getting from the server. So it's not really giving an accurate representation of the performance of someone coming to the site for the first time. This is even more obvious if I visit this page through clicking a link instead of reloading the page. This time, the entire process took less than half a second and most of the resources were loaded directly from cache and didn't even need to make a request to the server. Now it is useful to see how caching affects performance, but if you want to get a perspective as a first time visitor to your application, you can turn off caching under these settings, just click disable cache, and then if you reload the page again, it won't use the cache. This time the request took about 1.3 seconds and the gray bars are wider because it's actually loading them in from the server instead of loading them in from the cache. Now there are several ways that we can analyze this output to help us improve performance, but first I wanna show you another way that you can generate a waterfall report outside of Chrome. And that is at webpagetest.org. Uh, here you could just enter in your URL and it will tell you how that page loads for free at a given place around the world or you can change which web browser is used to load the page. And there are also some advanced settings you can use to uh, customize the connection speed. Oh, dial up, that'd be fun. Or you can uh, even record some video. So a lot of cool features here. I'll just leave it at this and start the test. Now the test might take a minute or two, but just let it run. It's been pretty fast for me. And the results are in. So this actually loads the page twice. The uh, first view took about two and a half seconds and the repeat view took about one second thanks to caching. And this also gives us a waterfall a report and a screenshot, which are both very useful. Let's take a look at this waterfall. So this report is quite similar to what we saw in Chrome, but for a different browser. And also this gives us a CPU and bandwidth usage graph, which is quite cool. Now web page test does more than just this. It also grades your application in a variety of areas. You can see we're doing pretty good in most areas except caching static content. Let's see what's up with that. Well, as it turns out, the many of the images on that page do not include a max age or expires headers in their response. This is something that the asset pipeline helps us with, but I'm not going through the asset pipeline for these particular images. To fix this, I'd probably just configure the web server to add an expires header for these particular images. If you want to learn more about HTTP caching and how the headers work, check out episode 321. Now there's a lot more information on this page. If you scroll up, you can see a complete checklist showing us each request and whether or not they pass a given a check. Now there are some other tools that also give this kind of information, so let's check them out. One such tool is available right within Chrome called Audits, so I'll go here and tell it to run this page. So this gives us several suggestions to improve performance, including the one we saw earlier about adding an expires header to leverage the browser caching for these resources. Another tip it gives is to move some various assets into different domain names so that way it can parallelize the download of these by opening more connections. On a similar note, if you move the static assets to a domain which doesn't match the cookies, then the client won't send the cookies for each request 
to the static assets. This is more critical if you have a lot of large cookies matching that domain. Now this also warns us about images which don't include the dimensions in the HTML. Fixing this will make the layout more consistent while it's loading. Now this next one is pretty neat. This tells you what CSS selectors were not used by this page. So you might want to consider removing these unless you use them elsewhere. You can also check out episode 180 for some other tips regarding that. Well that's it for this audits tool, but there is another tool that does something similar that I also want to show you quickly. And that is Google's PageSpeed Insights. You could either use their online tool or a browser extension. I'll do the browser extension here. So let me install this extension, and then I'll say add to Chrome. And let's add it. All right, so I've got this extension installed now, but this is pretty much useless here, so you might want to hide that button. Instead, you can interact with it through the developer tools. On the side here, there's a page speed option. And then just click analyze, and it will generate a report. And here are the results. Some things are the same, such as I mentioned to leverage browser caching, but there are some other great suggestions, such as one to combine images into CSS sprites. And it even tells you which images you should combine into a sprite. And I agree with this, it's very cool. And also with any of these suggestions, you can learn more about it. So this gives you some reasons on why you should do this and some tips on how to do it and various tools you can use. Also check out episode 334 for more information on CSS sprites. Another thing PageSpeed gives you are tips on how to optimize images. There are several images on this page that can be further losslessly compressed. It tells me how much it will be reduced by and even shows me the compressed image. Yep, looks just as good as the original. Overall, PageSpeed is a very useful tool and I am impressed. There's one more I want to show you here though and that is defer parsing of JavaScript. I haven't really talked about JavaScript much yet, but you can do a lot with profiling and optimizing it, and it plays a critical part in how fast a page feels. Now before tackling this issue of deferring JavaScript parsing, it helps to get a better understanding of how JavaScript is currently loaded in. Now if we take a look back at the Network Waterfall report, you can see that the loading of the JavaScript, which is happening right here, prevents the loading of any other resources. Any of these images here are not going to be loaded until the JavaScript is done being loaded in. Even worse, though, is that the rendering of the HTML page stops at this point as well, so the user is basically going to see a blank screen until this JavaScript is done loading. I'm going to demonstrate this problem further in the simple Rails app, which is designed to manage projects and tasks. Now I'm including the JavaScript in this layout file. This is just JavaScript include tag application. Very simple, this is something you'll find in most Rails applications, including my own. The problem is that everything stops rendering at this point until the JavaScript is done loading. To demonstrate this, I'm going to change this path to slash sleep, which is something that I've already set up. That sleep path will redirect to this controller, which simply sleeps for two seconds and then renders nothing. Now let's see what happens when I load this page. I don't get a response for two seconds and there I finally see the page rendered. Let's see this again with the network tab open, reloading the page, and I don't really see anything until the actual sleep.js finishes, which takes two seconds. Now hopefully no JavaScript loading would take quite this long, but even if it's just a couple hundred milliseconds, it really does impact how fast a site feels. Now there are several solutions to this problem. One is to move the JavaScript down to the bottom of the body tag, so this way it won't block the rendering of the rest of the page. So now when I reload the page, the page renders instantly, even though the JavaScript is still being loaded. Now another thing we can do is load this script asynchronously. To do this reliably across browsers, it's a little bit messy. It requires some code that looks something like this. Uh, basically, this is just a, an inline script tag here, which is just going to insert another script tag for that JavaScript, which needs to be loaded in, and that way it will happen asynchronously and will not block the rest of the loading. To demonstrate this, I'm going to move this script tag back up here at the top. So now when I reload the page, uh, the view will continue on rendering even though the JavaScript is loading because it's done asynchronously. So now that we have this working, I can switch this back to our application.js file so this way the loading of our JavaScript won't block the rendering. Now when you're doing this, watch out for other JavaScripts that exist outside of this one. If they rely on jQuery, you're going to have a problem because who knows when jQuery will be available and fully loaded in here since it happens asynchronously. If you can, try moving all scripts to the asset pipeline so they're all loaded within this one application.js file. You can load scripts dynamically within the application.js as well. There are also some other tools to help out with these dependency issues, such as require.js. 
Another thing to watch out for when loading JavaScript asynchronously is the increased chance that a user might do something on the page that requires JavaScript when it hasn't been fully loaded. So in this case, the destroy link requires JavaScript, so you might want to change that so it degrades gracefully like this show in episode 77. One more note about this, this is pretty messy here in the layout file. I'd probably move this into the partial because the important part right here, the path to the JavaScript file, is sort of hidden among the rest of this. There we go, that's much nicer. It's now all tucked away inside of a partial, and the path is passed in here so we can change the JavaScript path if we need to. Now I'm going to finish up this episode by focusing on JavaScript performance and profiling. First, let me show you how the JavaScript works on this site. If I go to a specific project, you can see I have a list of tasks which I can check off, and when I check one off, it instantly goes into the completed tasks through some AJAX. Now, let me show you the JavaScript for this. In particular, I want to focus on this JavaScript snippet right here. Uh, for each of the task checkboxes, this is going to listen to the click event, and when that happens, it's going to submit the surrounding form. Now, because the form is marked as remote, this will end up triggering that AJAX functionality. Now, let's say I have a thousand tasks, and I would like to improve the JavaScript performance for this given scenario. First, let's do some profiling to see how it performs. And now, there are several profile tools available, and one is right in the Chrome Developer Tools. It's at this Profiles tab, and I can just click Start here and then reload this page. Now, just ignore the abysmal server-side performance for this. We're going to focus on the client-side performance, and I can stop the profiler. So this bottom-up view tells us which parts of the JavaScript took the longest. Now, there is another way to view this profile, and that is top-down or tree. Sorry, it's a little bit off-camera here. But this basically tells you the top of the stack, and you can drill down to see the other calls that were made. Now, the time for each call is displayed in a percentage, but we can toggle that to uh, display it in milliseconds. And you can see that a jQuery ready callback, which ends up triggering the code I showed you earlier, ends up taking about 31 milliseconds. Not too bad, but let's see if we can get it down further. Now, before I get into optimizing this, I want to show you another way to trigger the profiler, and that is through JavaScript. You can just call console.profile and then pass in a title. Let's call it task checkboxes. And then we can end it when we're finished just by calling profile end, like that. Now we don't even have to start the profiler, just reload the page and it will automatically insert a profile entry. And if we check this out, uh, you can see it only took 22 milliseconds this time. And what's nice about this approach is that it isolates into just what you're interested in profiling in the code. So with our profile in place, we can experiment with performance. So instead of doing an on-click event of these checkboxes, let's just call tasks on, and then let's do the click event on the checkboxes in this manner. And I'll reload the page to run the profiler again. And let's check out that report. And that one only took two milliseconds to process, much faster. However, maybe this is just deferring the time until the actual click event happens. How might we figure that out? Now I want to show you another tool for analyzing browser performance called Speed Tracer. Now, this is a Chrome extension, so I'll add it to Chrome here. All right, so now I have Speed Tracer installed, and clicking on this will open it up and start recording. So let me make an event by clicking on a checkbox here, and then I can click on this button to stop recording. So here are the results, and you might find it necessary to click on this button to expand it, and then you can see all the events which took place. And you can see there was a click event, and you can see all the details of what happened on that given event. Now, I'm still learning about this tool, so I might be reading this report wrong, but the time it takes to do the JavaScript callbacks reported here are all quite fast. This one is less than two milliseconds. Also, I've done some comparisons with the click function in jQuery here, and the times reported were quite similar, so I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between the two and the performance in this particular application, but I may be wrong there. Either way, give this tool a try in your own app and see what you get. You can find further documentation on it on Google's developer site. Well, that's it for this episode. While I was researching this, it really opened my eyes into how much can be done on the client side to make a site feel faster. I hope you found it useful as well.